read most of this chapter, but I want to read four verses. Verse 4 through 7. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. All right, you may be seated. So John chapter 11 is about Jesus' friend Lazarus and, and him dying. Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Mary. I did. I was doing some research. When you go to chapter 12, I think Mary was the one that God the, took uh, seven demons out of. No. No, I was Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Mary of uh, Bethany. This is the Mary, yeah, this is the Mary that poured the, the ointment on his feet. Yes, right. that's in the next chapter. Um, so I thought about this. I thought about the death and the resurrection. The comparison. So I, 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 you know, I just wonder. I'm going to call him Yeshua because that's the Jewish name for Jesus. So I just wonder what Yeshua's thoughts were as he approached the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read a few verses now. Verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany. The town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Martha, which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And I read the next four verses. I want you to think about this, all right? You wonder what Jesus' thoughts were when he approached the tomb of his friend Lazarus. All right? It says in this chapter, it says the stone tomb with a stone tomb with a stone in the entrance that needed to be moved. Same thing happened with Jesus when he's buried in Joseph of Arithmetic's tomb. Okay? They, they rolled that stone, they sealed it. All right? So we are told in John 11.35, the shortest verse of the Bible, that what? That Jesus wept. So peering into the void of death, Yeshua was probably acutely aware of what was coming for himself. Because he knew that he came as the Messiah. He came as what? As the perfect Lamb of God. He came to seek and save those that were lost. But he also came to die on the cross. And this was still coming. He, he knew that this was coming. All right. But he wasn't afraid. He just yelled into the face of death. I love this. He yelled at death. And he says, Lazarus, come out. I mean, this is God, Jesus, God, man, yelling at a tomb saying, Lazarus, come out. Now, Lazarus has been dead for a few days. He's wrapped up in, you know, the way they, they bury him and stuff in the Jewish custom. Now, he's been in heaven. I want you to understand this. I've, I've seen credible testimony of people who've been to heaven to come back. And I, I assure you, they don't want to come back. When you're in the presence of God, you don't want to come back here. Paul is a great example of this. Lazarus, come out. So in comparison to Yeshua's ability to supernaturally bust out of his grave clothes, you know, Jesus was a, he folded the, the cloth, left it on the stone, nice and neat when they went in there to look for him. You know, uh, Lazarus is just, you know, coming out of it, man. He, 
He was back alive. I want you to think about this, all right? So Lazarus stumbles out of the grave, unable to walk, in need of assistance. As you read through this whole, read this chapter when you have a chance. Really, really great chapter. So the whole passage deals with the terrible threat of the grave. All right? The slam dunking death, because he was dead. He was sick and he died. But what does he do? He brings it back to life. All right? And what happens is this glorious demonstration of the Messiah's resurrection power. He was showing them a, a taste of what he was going to show them when he is risen from the dead. Amazing thing. So I want you to think about how God killed death. So it's not only the death of a sick friend that Yeshua stares down, but his own imminent death. He knows what's coming. It's, it's down the road. It's short and coming here. And the very, the very idea of death itself. Yeshua hears that Lazarus is ill, but announces, I like this. He didn't just like <laughs> ran to him because he heard it. What does he do? He says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He trusted the Father that he would give him the power to raise him from the dead. He understood this. You know, but he didn't run back. Listen to this. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, and Lazarus. You know, this is the place where he hung out. I want you to think about this. When he traveled and all this, when he went to Bethany, that was like, that was like Hotel, Motel 6 for him, you know. But it was these three that he loved and they loved him. And he spent time with them. And he stayed there. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. You think that meant that he didn't care for this man? You think that he didn't care for the for the pain that the sisters are going through? They just lost their brother. That's right. Then after this, he said to the disciples, "Let us go to Judea again." Then he says, "All right, let's go." So now Lazarus has been dead for several days. All right, and you know he didn't have a jet. He didn't have a, a G five. He didn't have a car. He didn't have you know. He walked. He walked from place to place. If you have a good study Bible, you can follow the, the feet of Jesus. All right? In his three and a half years. That's what he did in those days. He never read, he never got on the horse. He only got on a donkey on Palm Sunday. And that was because of prophecy. So the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the news, the Jews sought to stone you. And you are going there again. I want you to understand, they... He did things there, and they were looking to take him down. They hated him. They hated who he was. They hated the fact that he took attention away from the fair, you know, the guys, the Gary's are all dressed nice and they pious praying and all that good stuff. They hated him. And he said, are you sure this is a good idea, Yeshua? You'll probably get killed. And Thomas pessimistically resigns himself to death alongside the master. He says, look, if he's going to die, I'm going to die with him. And he's thinking about death now. He's thinking about he's going to lose his life for Christ. Yeah. All right. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. He was ready to be martyred, to die with Jesus Christ. This is all building up in this story. It's all building up. Yeshua, on the other hand, had his eyes fixed on what? On life and glory that was about to come. Both for Lazarus and himself. I mean, we can only, we can only think about what he was thinking about. But you know what? We have the mind of Christ. The Bible says his thoughts are in this book. The disciples, those who wrote these books... All right, the Holy Spirit inspired him. So we do have what he was thinking. It's an amazing thing. And the whole world, not much beats rising from the dead, right? Yeah. I mean, if you see a person risen from the dead, that kind of like, that trumps a lot of things. Yeah. All right. So that is the point that he was about to make. Because he loved that family so much, he waited for Lazarus to die by staying two more days where he was. He delayed on purpose. Why? To bring the glory to the Father. 
and to bring a tremendous witness to those people, they're all lamenting him. Lazarus had friends. They had friends. And in those days, I mean, you know, they, they are wailing. The Bible says they wailed over him. Yeah. They wailed and they're trying to comfort the sisters. All right. Because he loved that family so much, he waited. The Messiah has power over death itself. Resurrection is not a vain hope, but a certain reality. I want you to understand this. The, that show I told you I watched. The man, the atheist, his mentor said, look, if you can take down the resurrection story, it's like a house of cards. If you can disprove that, it's all going to fall in. And that's what he did. He tried to prove that Christ was not resurrected. He tried to prove that he was just another man. And, 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 and his fact finding, because he was a reporter, what happens? He finds Christ. He finds the truth. All right, but I want you to understand this. What does God love? He loves life. He wants you and I to have more abundant life. Yes, we're in this world. We're of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Do you understand that? Because we have the kingdom of God inside of us. We are different. We're peculiar. When we're faced with all sorts of challenges and differences, we have God inside of them. We have his thoughts and his mind and his word. It's there to encourage us. It's there to direct us. Right. We can see how much God hates death just by looking at what the law of Moses. It's usually translated clean and unclean. In the English Bible, there are two concepts that are actually quickly, they're tricky to convey. Let me try to, the Hebrew word for, the Hebrew words are tahor, it means pure. And tameh, which means ritually unclean or defiled and there were a lot of laws in the Torah about this all right these words essentially talk about a state that is acceptable or pleasing to God ritually clean ritually clean or the opposite all right there is not the sense of sin exactly but just conditions that must be met or dealt with in order to enter God's presence you know that the high priest who would take on the sacrifice every year to go into the inner court, the most inner court. They tied a rope around him. Because if he wasn't right before God, he was instructed to have to drag the body out. You understand? But he was presenting the offering for the sins of Israel. All right? But because Jesus Christ took on the sins of the world, we don't have to worry about that. We, we have access to the inner throne room of God. And we're positioned up there in Ephesians 2, 6 through 8. We're positioned with God in this throne room. So it's not hard to see how touching dead bodies might defile a person from a hygienic point of view. I mean, I haven't touched too many dead bodies. All right? Um, I want you to think about this. They thought about it. if you touch a dead body, you run clean. You have to go through this whole ritual all right, we come back to the temple. All right, spiritually speaking, they were defiled. But what about the nocturnal emissions and, and the monthly menstrual cycles that make a person to make? That means unclean. All right, and we all know what that is, right? The women's thing. All right, um, many of these issues that the Torah objects to, things that make a person to make are actually connected to death. They create a state that is undesirable to God and must be dealt with. Many find these laws, they're puzzling, they're sexist. I mean, in this day and age, oh my goodness. They're oppressive. But in the fact, if you think about it, they relate to it, to a loss of potential life. So that's the real problem. What is it? God loves life. He loves life. He wants life for you and he wants life for me. So anything that results in the loss of life, it grieves God. I want you to think about our relationships this morning. When we say something to somebody that, that's close to us, our words what you know just destroy who they are. It, it gives them insecurities, they it gives them <coughs> They have a, a trust issue, all right? That grieves God, why? Right? Because God wants life. 
He wants us to be close to each other, but even closer to him. It's a lot easier to treat somebody with kindness when you allow God's love to flow through you towards that person. When you see that person with the eyes of God. And that's a supernatural thing, by the way. You can't do it on your own. In the flesh, you look at somebody that's done you wrong, you want to, you know. But in God's eyes, he said, I, he sees them on the cross and says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Only God can give you that heart and those eyes toward the person. And actually towards an enemy. So back to John 11 and the issue of death, all right? Yeshua hears Lazarus is ill, but knows it will not lead to death. He deliberately waits till Lazarus dies because he loves this family. And then he walks right into a death trap. He knows that they're gunning for him. He knows that they're after him. They're trying to find anything they can, all right, to get him arrested, to get him, to get him killed. But there are people waiting to murder him. He commands Lazarus, Lazarus, Lazarus come out of the hold of the grave. And that only really angers those religious leaders. When they see a dead man, they know he's dead. They've gone to his funeral and he walks out of the grave. You know they were, they were very angry. And they're just looking for anything to go after who Jesus Christ was. So, but G uh, Yeshua does not shrink back one iota. He stares death down. He conquers the ultimate enemy, and that's the thief of life. I want you to realize how precious that verse is and that passage is. That means that you and I, in this physical body, we might die, but we're going to live forever. You understand that? Your soul and spirit are going to live forever. If, if Christ comes and we're raptured to all, all three parts and we have a glorified body, but you're going to live forever. And if something happens in your life, God will give you the grace. If you love Christ, he's going to come and give you the grace even to go from this existence to eternal existence. I want you to understand that. You've known people that, have, uh, that, that you love, that have passed away, gone, that have gone by way of heaven. I know my parents, I, I, I mean, you have your own stories. But I always trusted that God was there with them. In those last moments. And he sends angels. He sends angels to bring them in. Into his presence. That's amazing. You know. So. Alright. I'm going to end with this. His distaste for death is clear. But we also see a few things in John 11. That you sure he really loves. You know what he loves? He loves it when people believe. And he loves it when God's glory is shown. Because it's a blessing to God. When you ever seen a child in your life that sees you either uh, in, in some kind of act and some kind of action, and it, it, you know, it's something that, that just really blesses them, and that you cause that in their lives, and you see that big smile on their face because you gave it to them, you presented it to them. As parents and grandparents, you know that this blows you out of the water, don't it? That you were the part of giving them that joy and giving them that pleasure. That's how God looks at us. So believing in Yeshua, of course, is what is the antidote to death. If we believe in him and we have him as our personal Lord and Savior, we do not have to fear death. We don't have to fear it. Why? Because it's just, it's a natural thing because of sin issue in the world. But who has conquered the, the sin issue? Jesus Christ has. Who's conquered the death thing? Jesus Christ has. Who's resurrected from the grave? Jesus Christ was. And we are co, we died on the cross with him, we're buried with him, and we were risen with him. Do you understand that? We are part of that whole, that whole legacy and that reality. Our faith is more precious to him than gold. He doesn't want anyone to perish and doesn't want us to die. You understand that? All those people that you love, all those people that you pray for, he doesn't want them to die. In a sense, for eternity, he wants them to come and, and, and believe on him and, and, and be saved. He wants us to believe. He's very glad when 
chances appear that help that help us to believe. You know, our very faith makes him puts a big smile on his face. Think about that. It just it just makes his day. So the idea of resurrection does appear in the Hebrew scriptures. Job thought to be the oldest book in the Bible. Hence at the idea that it's not all over with when he when we die in Job 19, 25 to 26. In Daniel, in Daniel 12, 23, it says this multitude who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. All those people, you know, from dust to dust. God created us from dust. You, you get buried in the, in the earth, you turn to dust. When Christ comes back, all the, those that are in the earth are will, will going to be there a, a millisecond before we are. They're going to be with Christ in the clouds before we are. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. You know what that verse is saying? That everybody's going to live forever. Everybody. Some in heaven with him and some in hell because of the fact that they rejected who Christ is. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the, of the heavens, the morning star order. And those who lead many to righteousness, those who are soul winners, those who share Christ with people. All right? Like the stars forever and ever in Daniel 12, 2 and 3. Isaiah 26, 19, Psalm 16, 10, Isaiah 53, talks about death will not have the final say. The religious leaders of Yeshua's day were divided on the matter. The Pharisees claimed that there was a resurrection, but what? But not understanding how it worked. According to Yeshua, the Sadducees were not accepting that there was life after death. That's why they were called Sadducees. They were Sadducees. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was not a strong theme of scripture until Yeshua came to town. It was a bit hazy and open to interpretation. The world was waiting for answers and truth. And guess who gave it to him? This carpenter from Galilee who seemed to know a thing or two about what? The life after death. He spoke with authority. You know, these guys had like these sheepskins. They had all these credentials on the wall. You know, I've been to... Uh, Jerusalem University, the theological seminary. You know, he had nothing except what? A relationship with the Father. When he was 12 and his parents brought him into Jerusalem, where was he? He was in the temple talking to the teachers, talking to the Sadducees and all the teachers. And they were, they were what? They were amazed by him because he, he was God in the flesh. And, his, and then his parents went back, he was missed, and they came back and said, why did you put us to us? He says, I was in my father's house. Didn't care of my father's business. He was amazing. So Yeshua, Yeshua gives us a sneak peek, uh, peek behind the curtain of death in Luke 16, 19 through 31. He tells a story illustrating the sobering finality of eternal destiny everlasting life this is this is you know the Lazarus and what and the rich man this is that story and what happens is the rich man is in hell and he's he's thirsty he's you know he can't he can't quench his thirst and where's where's Lazarus he's by Abraham's side a Abraham's bosom and there's this great gulf dividing them and he said to Moses, the rich man said to Moses, have him bring a, have him bring me a drop of water so I can quench my thirst. He says, there's no way. There's a, there's a separation here. And he was really a, an amazing soul, if you think about it. This guy in hell, because he said, send him back. Send him back to what? To, 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 to come and tell my brothers and sisters about this place called hell, because it's a reality. You know, in today's economy in today's culture. The devil's done a good job to tell people help doesn't exist, but it does exist. The word of God talks about it five times more than it does heaven in the gospels. It's a reality. It's a reality. That's why we tell people about Christ. We don't want to see nobody. God doesn't want to see anybody go there. But they make a choice to either accept or reject Jesus Christ. So through the example of Lazarus, both in explanation and live demonstration 
it becomes clear that the Messiah does not merely know the way of death, but what he is the way out. He says in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except Amen. by him. So I'm going to close with this one verse. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. That's everybody. That's anybody. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That means that everybody on the earth has a chance for what? For salvation. That's why, that's why we talk about Christ. That's why we're not quiet about Christ. To be part of that verse, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Isn't that amazing? It's simple. It's, it's not works. It's nothing you can do. You're not good enough to go to heaven. You're only good enough to receive the free gift, free gift, right? Because you didn't have to do anything for it, of salvation. It's by grace through who? Through Jesus Christ. Because he took the sins of the world on himself. So the, the testimony we heard this morning, we pray for his precious uh, sisters here and their brother. That he heard this from a man, a, a man of God saying that, because of his sins, that's why he has cancer. I mean, that's not true. That is not true. We need to pray for that pastor, too, who said that. That he really meets who Jesus Christ is. He, reads the, he meets the grace and mercy of God's character. Look, if people say things, they say that God is this and God is that. If you meet Christ, if you meet God, you're going to meet the true character. And you know what that is? It's love. God is love. And then all these other things, all why is there so many de denominations? Because people get away from the simple truth that God is love. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're one. They're one. There's no division amongst them. There will be no denominations in heaven. None whatsoever. Because the body of Christ, and you're a part of that, is going to be the bride of Christ. We're going to be married to Jesus Christ forevermore. I won't know my wife as my wife there. I'll know her in Christ Amen. and vice versa. So, Father, thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you came. You died on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you took our place on that cross. And he loved us even when we were your enemy. Thank you for your precious word. God, use this word. Holy Spirit, draw people to, to the reality and the truth of who Christ is. Save souls today. Save souls. If you've never received Jesus Christ, he's God who became man. Invite him into your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me today. I want to, I just want to draw closer to you. I want to fall in love with you. Change me from the inside out because I can't change myself. So bless us. Bless those who have received Christ. Bless those who are believers. And help us to draw closer to you. Thank you for your blessing. We ask that Christ is a state. Amen.